It's really a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Barry Kohler, who is currently uh, the Vice President for Medical Affairs, uh, Physician-in-Chief at the unique uh, Rockefeller Hospital, and the David Rockefeller Professor at Rockefeller University, where he heads the Allen and Francis Adler Laboratory of Blood and Vascular Biology. Uh, Barry received his BA from Columbia, 1966, magna cum laude, uh, a year before I did. His MD from New York University School of Medicine in 1970, did a residency in internal medicine at Bellevue, had advanced training at the NIH uh, in hematology and clinical pathology in Harvey Grounick's lab, was at Stony Brook from 76 to 93, and then from 93 to 2001 served as professor of medicine and chair of the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, he's come to Rockefeller in 2001 in the capacities I described. Just a, a brief word about the extraordinary work he's done over the course of his career. He and his colleagues uh, really did the major work contributing to elucidating the receptors, not only for fibrinogen, but von Willebrand factor, crucial to the blood clotting process. Uh, his team developed monoclonal antibodies that bind to these receptors, inhibit platelet aggregation, and thus slowing or stopping the cascade of events that leads to both heart attack and stroke. The drug abciximab uh, developed from one of these antibodies, uh, affectionately by him, I'm sure, called 7E3, has been used to treat more than 2 million <coughs> patients since its approval by the FDA in 1994. For this work, and other work I haven't had time to describe. He's received many, many awards, including the Passero Foundation Award in 2005, the Alpert Foundation Award, and uh, election to the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So fittingly enough, uh, he serves, uh, in terms of our symposium today, as the principal investigator at the Rockefeller University Center for Clinical and Translational Science, and we're fortunate then to have him speak today uh, on the subject of forging a cultural identity for clinical and translational science. Barry. First, let me uh, thank Dean Spiegel for the wonderful introduction. Very, very appreciative. It's so great to see so many colleagues and friends from past parts of my career here, and particular colleagues from uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, this institution. Uh, is unique in having such a strong reputation both in its basic science and in its community identity and outreach. And I think that that really is uh, uh, a tribute to an academic medical center because I think most academic medical centers uh, are unfortunately not able to maintain that balance and so I think it's particularly fitting that the CTSA under the able leadership uh, of uh, the uh, Harry and uh, and Paul are in fact able to bring this uh, forward in such an effective way. Uh, we're the great beneficiaries at Rockefeller uh, of the uh, community outreach and its great strength here, uh, because Jonathan Tobin is one of our collaborators. That we're very proud of that collaboration. We've learned a lot from him. So uh, there are a lot of reasons why I'm I'm exceedingly happy to be here today. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, uh, explain a little bit about my title uh, because uh, I will be talking about cultural issues uh, ultimately and I think that it's important for us to keep these in mind and in, in hearing Dr. Bennett's talk uh, earlier, the, the whole discussion of defining a community and uh, I think uh, communities and cultures become a, a really crucial element but sometimes those communities exist with in the academic medical center as much as between the academic medical center and elsewhere. So the, the great thing about medicine is it allows one to combine humanism and science. Uh, and I really want to make sure that we're rooted in the goal here, uh, which is actually the connection between these two and their interdigitation, which uh, the caduceus uh, is uh, a good image to, to help stress that point. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out what really motivated me. Uh, I guess Karl Mannheim said, if you want to know something about someone, don't ask what they think, find out what they take for granted. Uh, this is what I take for granted, but it took me a long time then to get it to the level of being able to articulate it. And it's really that 
Uh, if you think about uh, our world, it was really taking the scientific method and using it to promote health and alleviate suffering. That's probably our greatest achievement. And the fact that we, everyone in this room, participates in this process one way or another, the fraction of people in the world who actually have a chance to participate in this process uh, is minuscule. And so the first thing that I want you to have a sense of is my sense of privilege, meaning the privilege of actually being able to, each day of my life, think about this and do my best, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but do my best to actually move this process forward, because I think this is the key. So if you believe that, as I do, then there's a, a very simple corollary of this, and that is that research is not one of the three missions of academic medicine, it is the mission. And I was brought up on this image, the three-legged stool, where an academic medical center, it does research, it does patient care, it does education, and those are three identifiable missions. And this image, as well-intentioned as I think it was, is profoundly wrong because it views research as off to the side uh, and therefore potentially something you do on the margin, you do if you have enough money, if you have enough time. Uh, it misses the whole point because if you believe what I said at the beginning, if you believe in that core principle, this is just a wrong formulation. So I offer this, uh, a four-legged stool with a cushion. <laughs> and so the cushion is research, and the real question is, are we in fact applying research to every one of the components that we do? To me, that's really the criterion, and I want to modify the old one uh, by virtue of emphasizing community service and now global health as part of the real responsibilities of every academic medical center. And as you heard, I went to Columbia College in the 1960s. And I actually believe that these elements, in particular community service and global health, are inextricably linked to social justice. And again, I know that this is an institution in which social justice issues are things that are a serious concern, uh, not just lip service. But I actually believe that by contributing to uh, the improvement of human health, that that has a profound impact on social justice. And, if you'd like some other time, I'll come back and talk about that. So if you have followed me this far, uh, I have a really simple definition of translational research. Uh, and it's the application of the scientific method to address a health need. And I don't really care where along the process it is. To me, they're all equivalent, because the process is a unified process and the goal is unified. And the real question is whether you are, in fact, m making maximal use of the tools of science to achieve the goal. Now, translational research is different from basic science research. And I've tried to just give you a sense of why I think it is different. Scientific discovery is a magnificent, aesthetically perfect paradigm. You have uh, a central model. There are implications from the model. You can, if you're clever, design an experiment to test the implications. If the implications are borne out, great, the model is supported. If the implications aren't borne out, even better, the model is incomplete or just wrong. Under any and all circumstances, new knowledge comes. It's a certainty as long as you've done the process well. Translational research starts from the very opposite end. It starts with the articulation of a health need, and in this case, it scans the body of existing knowledge to see whether or not there's something in that body of knowledge that actually can have an impact on that health need. And the goal isn't just knowledge. The goal is actually to improve health. Now, frankly, the uncertainty in translational research is enormously high. Uh, and in fact, the vast majority of such efforts are failures. And so the real key, from my standpoint, is advising people that the best experiment is an experiment that has both a scientific discovery hypothesis and a translational hypothesis. 
because the translational hypothesis is almost certain to burn <laughs> and crash. Uh, but if there was embedded in there a scientific discovery hypothesis as well, there may be information that the next person, or if you're lucky enough to get another shot at it, uh, can bring forward. So I think there have been three separate scientific revolutions brought to medicine, and these are, I consider, essentially complete from the standpoint of having such a firm base as to be self-supporting. Uh, reduction of science, and we could have a lot of fun, and uh, I know that uh, Bill Crowley spoke earlier this morning, and unfortunately I couldn't be here, and I'm sure he's covered a number of the things that I'm talking about, and I just want to recognize the fantastic job he's done in leading the clinical investigation world uh, through the Clinical Research Forum. Uh, but let me give you uh, my interpretation of where we stand from a perhaps slightly different perspective. So reduction of science, first observational, starting uh, from ancient times, the, uh, the Renaissance anatomists. I put 1770 because my favorite uh, pathologist, William Hewson, uh, wrote them. Uh, experimental, uh, probably uh, most people would point to Claude Bernard, who in 1860 was fighting the vitalists, really fighting them, saying, in fact, that humans were fit uh, uh, subjects of experimentation with the appropriate protections. And in fact, most of his critics were physicians. Uh, the second was controlled clinical trials. Most people will point to 1948, uh, although I think that there's some uh, uh, pushback on that. Uh, but 1962 I put there because that's when the uh, amendments to the FDA said you had to, for the first time, show that the drug was efficacious. And you had to show it was efficacious in a well-designed study. And that was an enormous impetus for people to actually go ahead and design the, 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 the science of clinical trial design, to develop the, the, the science of clinical trial design. And public health outcomes. Uh, of course, starting from the first time people were quarantined, uh, but really by the 1980s, and as we heard from Dr. Bennett, and I'm sure from others earlier today, beautifully developed into the methodology that you've heard about, and uh, Dr. Bala presented a, a, a good example of how, in fact, one brings science uh, to looking at important issues. So those who are here who may have not decided what they're going to do with their careers yet, let me offer you four challenges, uh, because I think there are four incomplete scientific revolutions. In each of them, there's been a reason why people have not brought science to them. Uh, those reasons are either better or less good, but I think that they're all mistakes, because I think that there are opportunities. Medical education is amazing how in the morning you can have a scientific discussion with a colleague that's very evidence-based, very critical, and in the afternoon go to a curriculum meeting where there is what I would call a faith-based discussion. Uh, and it's profound, the scotoma that people have for not bringing the tools of science to medical education. It, it is absolutely unthinkable, uh, and I've, uh, I could, I could uh, enlighten you with a, from PubMed, uh, if you put it under control trials and you put it under medical education, it, you it turn up about a handful uh, of studies. Well, why is that? I mean, why can't we design a clinical trial, a randomized study, to decide what's the best way to teach something? Why is that so hard? So think about that. Medical bioethics, uh, without, I don't want to spend too much time on take a lot of flack here, but medical bioethics has really, for the most part, been whether or not people are applying certain principles, principles that grew out of horrible experience, uh, but principles that are never, have never been validated in terms of data and empirical observation as relates to the outcomes desired. So it really is not the science that we think of as science. It's a very different process. And it's a process-driven rather than outcome-driven process, and those lead to serious problems. It's good to see that, in fact, now there is a growing commitment to uh, empirical evidence in medical bioethics, and I think that that will help the field, in fact, achieve what it's wanted to achieve from the beginning. 
Uh, Dr. Bennett was great in talking about behavior and showing you all, all of the changes. I wanted to uh, say I looked at the poster by Dr. Navi on uh, smoking cessation uh, as part of uh, uh, an integrated approach. And I saw that 38% of the, their patients had decided to quit uh, smoking. And so if you want to make a real contribution, find out about how to affect people's behavior. We've let the neurobiologists off the hook, frankly. Uh, there's now, I think, the beginnings of trying to connect neurobiology and imaging to behavior. Uh, but we certainly at a very primitive stage there. And one that I wish I had time to talk about because it's occupying a lot of my own efforts and other colleagues at Rockefeller in our bioinformatics, and that is human phenotyping. If we have to rely on ICD-9 codes to correlate with genetic and proteomic information, we will never, ever get to where we need to get to in terms of personalized medicine. We need an electronic research record matched the electronic medical record. The electronic medical record can populate parts of it, but I, I wish I had a half hour to talk about that but I don't. So here's the paradigm. If you're interested in disease like I am, or a cell, the chances are, if you are my age, you started out just thinking about pathophysiology of disease, and that's where everything stopped. And it stopped because we really didn't have the tools to go on. What was really exciting was we could study it through all of these different approaches. These are, you know, really fantastic different ways to think about it. And that's great because it allows you to learn lots of different techniques and all the rest. But I remember literally coming to grips with the idea when I started my research career that this is where I would end. Of course, occasionally somebody from a drug company would sit in the audience and they'd see a therapeutic target coming out of here or uh, others with diagnostic or preventive strategies. But for the most part, the academician was stuck at the level of pathophysiology. But now we've undergone multiple revolutions scientifically that should be empowering us. So here we have the therapeutic target. And now, of course, if you develop an assay, you can test many different things to modify uh, that target. And if you modify it the way you want, then you have a lead compound. Now, before I told you how privileged I feel to participate in this process, what I want to emphasize over here is how empowered you are because not one of the things over here was available when I started my career. Not one of them was available to an academic investigator. And now, of course, uh, chemistry and we've had a revolution in animal models, transgenics, that allow us to model human disease so much better. And of course, we've talked about this. And most of the time, people will stop the slide here. But I want to emphasize for the clinician, uh, the physician scientist, you don't have to spend the billion dollars to get here to make a major contribution. By understanding refined pathophysiology, which should be the hallmark of the physician investigator, one can look for new indications. And one can also look to improve the, uh, the utilization of an approved drug. Anybody who believes that in the first phase three study that got to approval, they got the right inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, dose, duration, and route, well, that's possible. On the other hand, aspirin's been around for over 100 years, and you still can't pick up a journal without somebody saying it's being given the wrong way. So if it took 100 years for aspirin, it probably every new drug that comes on the market you can do better with than they did in that phase three study if you're clever. And you don't have to then spend the 14 years going through the process. So I don't know if anybody went through this, but we are facing a serious problem. And I don't understand this problem at my gut, but I can't help but tell you it's a serious problem. And let me paint it for you. So this is NIH funding, and this is funding by Big Pharma. This is 1970, this is 2004, and you can see that 1986 this crossed and Big Pharma's, uh, this doesn't even include biotech, but Big Pharma crossed with the NIH. This is all in billions of $2,005, so this is all inflation adjusted. This is, these, are, these are actually comparable data. So it's clear there's been this massive ramp up in real dollars committed to research, and especially by Big Pharma and obviously uh, to a variable degree by NIH. Look at the number of new drugs. Whoa, 
I mean, despite this increase, this essentially log increase in dollars spent, real dollars spent, the number of new drugs hasn't changed. If I were to put up here the number of new genes identified, it would be like this. If I put up proteomics, it would be like this. And look at this. This is a serious problem. And frankly, I think the CTSA program is part of the reaction to this. Uh, remember, the CTSA program, just to give you some reality testing, is a half a billion dollars at its, at its projected maximum, as opposed to yesterday I heard from Pfizer that their current estimates of big pharma is $55 billion. And the person from Pfizer kept saying how they need partnerships with academia because academia actually understands pathophysiology and big pharma obviously doesn't because their $55 billion a year hasn't brought them a large number of new drugs. So if they think that with 1% of the funding in the CTSAs that we're going to deliver what they can't deliver with 100 times as much dollars, that's really a big challenge for us. Uh, but the situation is actually even worse than I said, because now if we just take a look at the total number of either biologics or new drugs coming that are being submitted to the FDA, it's going down. And this is a very, very serious problem that frankly defies an easy explanation. But uh, I can tell you that I think that the physician scientist and what your CTSA is trying to do and what our CTSA is trying to do I think is actually an important component in helping to address this serious problem. Uh, there are other issues though. Public trust. We heard uh, beautifully from Dr. Bennett about how crucial public trust is for people being willing to participate. The capital, the billion dollars, intellectual property, the stack of uh, of uh, patents that are now impeding uh, progress, even though it's crucial that there's intellectual property, otherwise there'll be no capital to develop anything. Walking that very, very thin line between intellectual property protection and paralysis from uh, a stack is a big, big issue. Uh, the improvement of animal models, uh, the infrastructure to support human subject studies I'll talk about, and unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about phenotyping anymore. So let's talk about the physician scientist, because I think that's the, uh, one of the things that's much on people's mind. So if you don't deal with these three things, then you might as well forget about it. So I just want to emphasize that medical school debt, child care, and housing are actually the minimum price to even begin to talk. You throw that into the ante. If you're not willing to ante that, then there's simply nothing else to discuss. There will be no progress. On top of that, though, we need training programs with secure funding, and I'll talk about that, and crucially, an access to an infrastructure to conduct studies. So I think that there really are three skills that a translational research investigator or team needs. Now, this is going to be focused on T1, but I can tell you that much of what I'll say, I think, is actually very, very much uh, 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 analogous to issues in T2 and to T3 and to T4 and whatever. Uh, so I said before that I think the process starts with the ability to articulate a health need. But that doesn't mean, mean we need to cure cancer. That means uh, articulation of a need with the same sort of precision that you would bring to a basic science hypothesis. The second is actually to create an asset, something that you can manipulate that's tractable, that you can actually test whether or not intervening with any one of a variety of different interventions can have the desired impact, which means it has to be uh, at least high throughput enough to be able to check multiple interventions, maybe at different uh, doses and all the rest. The other thing is, though, it has to have biologic and medical validity, meaning that the assumptions that went into the simplification have to be rooted in a real sense of medical and biologic science so that if you find something that actually affects the system the way you want it to, if you back it up into a whole animal or into a human, in fact, there's a reasonable likelihood that it'll have the desired effect. 
So we shouldn't be doing too many things at pH 2.5 if we really care about ever backing that back up into humans. And the third, and this is the one that usually creates the most, uh, most controversy, before beginning one and two, I think that the investigator or the team, this doesn't necessarily have to be in a single person, is the ability to at least at the conceptual level design a phase three study to assess safety and efficacy. Meaning, let's say everything goes perfect in one and two. Can you actually identify the way in which you would test to show that this thing really does what you hope it does? and with a reasonable number of patients at a reasonable cost with uh, equipoise in the design uh, and with an endpoint that will be an endpoint that people will say is meaningful enough to justify approval. That's a crucial and complex body of knowledge that's required to be able to actually do that. So what does this T1 translator really need? Well, they need clinical medicine, that's for sure, through their fellowship probably. They need basic science and they need mentor training for an extended period of time because they have to be able to create hypotheses, to deal with controls, to understand uh, where the status of uh, the field is and what the technology is. And they need a third body of knowledge which you can't get on the fly anymore if you ever could. And that is you have to understand the issues that will go into the design of that phase three study. That in fact is a separate body of knowledge. And I'll tell you a little bit about our clinical scholars program which is I'm sure very much like the programs you have here. It's focused on having a mentored patient oriented research protocol, experiential training going through the process as well as an accompanying curriculum which consists of a weekly tutorial that I run, biostatistical tour, tutorial, seminars by people discussing great science and then having lunch with them, understanding some of the issues that we're talking about, and always keeping the patient's perspective. I think the vast majority of concerns that people have about medical students getting hardened and trainees getting hardened is simply uh, an adoption of the perspective of the caregiver rather than the care receiver or the family member of a care receiver. And I think humanities in medicine, the theater, literature, uh, going to museums, uh, are ways in which you can keep alive in the trainee the perspective of the patient. Uh, this is designed for you not to be able to read easily. But it tells you that it takes a village to support a clinical investigator. Uh, over here is what our CTSA supports. Over here is what our university supports. We have made a commitment that every study that will be done in our institution will be done under the guidelines of what's called good clinical practice, GCP, which is a standard that if you wanted to do a study that was going to actually wind up going to the FDA for approval. And we think that that's the right thing to do. But I can tell you that that is not only a high standard, but it's a very expensive standard in terms of clinical research coordinators, nursing, FDA filings, et cetera. Uh, and it's a major, major commitment. So let's talk about the translation gap. This was taken from Nature. Uh, look what's happened to the number of uh, awards in NIH research projects. So here are the MD-PhDs, and I know you have a great MD-PhD program here, and we have one as well, but the numbers are actually very, very modest. The MD growth has been exceedingly modest, and this is, looks pretty ominous as this latest downturn. Uh, but of course, there's been this dramatic increase in PhDs, and that's been great because fantastic scientists have been brought into the field. Uh, but I think it's also created a mentality uh, that I'd call uh, not good and that some MDs think that, in fact, uh, one can outsource research to PhDs. And I think that that notion has crept into a lot of the things that are done in medical education and I think that's been uh, a serious problem for us. So I also think 
that people have said, well, gee, you know, I'll show you again. You look at this, well, it's clear the MDs simply can't compete. And I would say uh, they can't compete in the game and under the system that's been created, but maybe the system isn't fair. Maybe the, le the playing field isn't really level. And now I'll try and explain, and I don't think this was malevolent, but I'll explain why I think that's actually the case. So if we take the case of a PhD or an MD-PhD, uh, they virtually all have four to five years of mentored pre-doctoral research experience and then postdoctoral research experience of roughly the same uh, length, nine to 10 years of mentored experience. A clinical fellow, I'd say, has at most one to two years. Here, probably two years. Other places, maybe a half a year. Uh, but nothing more than that. If you add a clinical fellow plus a K08 or a K23 award, then in fact, you're getting up to six or seven which means that you're asking, or traditionally what we've been doing, uh, and especially before the K awards, we were asking these people to compete with these people. Well, that's, uh, that, you've got to be brain dead not to realize that's not a competition, that's, uh, that's uh, shooting fish in a barrel. Even over here, it's not really a fair fight. So what we've been trying to push for on the CTSA leadership is that the fellow plus a three-year K-12 plus a K-08 is finally in a position to compete in terms of their scientific background. And I'm betting that, in fact, if this goes on, that there will be uh, an increase in the competitiveness. Well, unfortunately, the problem is that the NIH has uh, rules that say you're only allowed six years maximum and even that's not a consistent rule. So the highest advocacy that I've had and others in the CTSA leadership has been to get NIH to create an NIH rule that says that even if you've had three years of a K-12, you're entitled to a full five years of a K-08 or a K-23. So I've talked about uh, these things up to here. And now I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about these three things down here, academic recognition, conflict of interest and forging a new cultural identity. So I love this uh, from Alvin Feinstein from Yale, uh, 1999. And so he pointed out that there was this peculiar inverse proportion between size of the object studied and academic prestige. This was a, an R value of about 1.0. Uh, and, uh, and it's really profound. And I think it's, again, a vestige of something from another era. And I think it's a vestige, maybe, of that three-legged stool. And I think it's a vestige of not understanding what the real goal is. Uh, but vestige or not, it's serious. And it's crucial that academic leadership, which I know you have here, understand this and reward the people who are doing things that contribute to what the, the goal is. I don't want to spend a lot of time on conflict of interest, but as you know, it remains a slippery slope, and it's a very serious issue. What I find fascinating is that there are a group of people who are absolutely committed to pro-therapeutic discovery, and there's another group of people who are absolutely committed to rooting out the slightest hint of conflict of interest. Now, you would imagine that the only way you can instruct this poor person in the middle who's sort of whipsawed between those two uh, is to actually get these two people in the same or these two groups of people in the same room at the same time to create a safe haven for where people will know that if they follow the rules that they will not wind up on the front page of some newspaper sometime. Uh, but that seems not to be happening still. And this group writes what it wants to write. This group does what it wants to do. And there seems to be an absolute uh, inability to communicate and sit down and develop what I call an energy minimum or an optimum uh, that will actually instruct this poor person in the middle. 
Okay, so let's move on to the cultural issues. Uh, I take this from 1940 just to show you this is not a new problem. <laughs> so this was Dr. Isaac Starr, the president of the uh, Young Turks. Uh, we are considered to be clinicians by physiologists, biochemists, and immunologists and considered to be physiologists, biochemists, or immunologists by most clinicians. So uh, that's both funny and serious uh, because it means that somebody is clearly not really identified as part of either. And being other is not easy, especially if you're going to spend your own whole career being other to two different groups in perpetuity. Okay, now how did we get into this? Well, I think that in fact there really are two different cultures. And the cultures see each other in a very predictable way if you understand where they come from. And so let me just walk you through a couple of things that I think identify the basis of where they in fact come from. We're back to what do they take for granted, not what they think. So. In medicine, you have to respond to the sick patient in front of you. And basic scientists are told, don't rush to judgment. Wait. Look for confirmation. How many different labs have gotten the same result? If you're the first one to say, gee, that was great, chances are you're going to be criticized as accepting something too quickly. Physicians, after they learn what pneumococcal pneumonia looks like, they know what that looks like. And their eye is out for something a little peculiar. You know, what's different about this patient, not what's the same. Whereas basic scientists, they look at the, the, the horizon rather than the forefront. They want to know what's generalizable. What's the general principle here? And if I got one outlier, well, you know, the statistician takes care of that. We don't want to get thrown off by that. We want to deal with what is the major trend here. Uh, physicians give up on controlling variables because every patient is unique. And you can define the good basic scientists by whether or not they can create an experiment in which there's only one variable. In medicine, we do a lot of things that re require conformity to accepted practice. We have practice guidelines. We have standard of care. Basic scientists are told, go out there, be bold, take risks. Error to a physician is absolutely the worst possible thing. You've got those headlines from the Institute of Medicine. Uh, you've got the newspapers. You've got the patients. You've got the lawyers. You've got everybody telling you, error is your mortal enemy. Over here, error is part of the way science is done. You make a mistake. You didn't design the experiment right. And now you go back and you redo it until you get it right. Error is expected, and actually, it's crucial for framing new hypotheses. Uh, the one that bothers me the most, as you might have already realized, is that physicians apply new knowledge, uh, whereas scientists discover new knowledge. And I think that this has been the worst thing that a uh, medical student can be told. So this is my uh, humble proposal. To, uh, just want to. Uh, you know, suggest that we go back to ancient Greece. But this is what I would add to the Hippocratic Oath, that I will advance the science of medicine by experimentation and or by making careful observations about my patients. And I will rapidly disseminate that knowledge to my colleagues so that all patients may benefit. So I think that this is what every medical student needs to hear on day one. They are part of discovery. They are not a passive receptacle of scientific information that they then apply. They are part of discovery. In medicine, uh, we have a lot of respect for experts. And if you're an intern like I was at Bellevue Hospital uh, and your resident told you to jump, you asked how high, and then you asked when you were allowed to come down. Uh, that you know, you, you could say what you wanted and you could challenge things, but when it finally came to making a decision, this had to really run in a smooth way. Basic scientists are taught to be very, very suspicious of expert opinion. If you put four journals in front of somebody and you wait to see what they reach for first, <laughs> you can tell a lot about them. Uh, and I don't have time to develop this now, but I actually think that Physicians taking the oath frames a world of acceptable research practice immediately. 
absolutely immediately. There have been attempts to have oaths for basic scientists. They haven't gotten very far, frankly. And uh, I had this discussion at Rockefeller. It was a very interesting discussion. We have no oath. <laughs> OK, finally, <laughs> each day you have to make a binary decision. And the binary decision is which tribe are you joining? And the way you join a tribe is you wear the right, uh, the uniform. And that uniform, if you wear the wrong uniform in the wrong culture, you will not only be suspect, but you're going to be potentially ostracized. But certainly, you will raise eyebrows either way. OK, so let me offer a couple of thoughts. First of all, to deal with the cultural issue, the first thing is we have to just recognize it. And that's why I wrote something about this, because I think if you sit and think about it, I can, each of you now can predict how a basic scientist is likely to see a clinician rushing to judgment, not as uh, disciplined, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see how a, a, a clinician coming off the wards, going into a research lab, is going to see the basic science. Overly deliberative, too concerned about the, I mean, it's, they're predictable. This is absolutely simple. But they need to be sensitized. The mentors need to be sensitized about what are going to be the problems of a clinical trainee coming in. The clinical trainees need to be sensitized as to the culture they're going into. If they were going to a foreign country, they'd read a guide. And they'd be really careful about it. And that's really what we need to do, to explain that to some extent they're moving into a different culture. And they have to be respectful of that culture if they want to be accepted in it. The other thing we need to do is we need to start listening and not just thinking about what we did when we trained, or even what the latest uh, initiatives are. So I'm going to give you one example that perhaps is a little bit out of the box, but I actually think it needs to be tested, and maybe the leadership here would be interested in testing it. So I think there were really two megatrends that I've seen during my career. One is that there's been a change in the American family, and that change has been from one to two careers. And the second megatrend is the need to create multidisciplinary teams to address translational hypotheses. I think that's pretty obvious. What's amazed me is nobody's put these two together, because I think they actually fit together very effectively. And I'll offer you this thought. Uh, how about a delayed independence track, a track that allows junior investigators to work in a really high quality team for an extended period of time? until family responsibilities permit them to assume the responsibilities of a principal investigator. Sorry for the typo. I changed the slide yesterday. Uh, so I think that this is something worth testing. And I've talked, I talked to a lot of young investigators. And it's amazing how many of them actually have told me that they think this is an interesting idea. And I think that there are shortcomings to this, and there are dangers. There's the potential for exploitation. There would need to be uh, the ability to recognize these contributions. There'd be a need to deal with tenure. There'd be a need to deal with equitable salary, and so on and so forth. I'm not naive about it. I've been around. On the other hand, I think this actually has the potential to integrate those two uh, megatrends into something positive. So finally, I think to build a cultural identity, we actually need an identity builder, namely a society. And the, the, the goals of such a society would be to promote education and research in clinical and translational science in order to improve human health so that there's no, no uh, movement away from the, the, the real goal. And it is to forge a cultural identity, to give a people a sense of pride that what they're doing, in fact, is part of a group that shares those values, understands that basic principle that we started out with, and I think doing this through an annual meeting and public education are really the, the ways to do it. And an, an annual meeting in which trainees have the ability to share their science, to be tutored by good mentors, to have world-class uh, senior scientific leaders comment, in which they have a chance to develop uh, career development workshops, to understand many of the things that they'll never hear in a subspecialty meeting, 
to have the ability to understand what's the latest in each of these areas that might affect how they want to design their research, to have this focus much more on the process of research than necessarily the results of uh, the research in a very specific uh, organ-based discipline. And to get updates from crucial uh, members of the, uh, the team, the NIH, the FDA, and so on and so forth, and industry. Because if there isn't industry partnership, there will not be translation. That's the bottom line. And maybe one plenary session with uh, uh, great examples of contributions across the entire spectrum. And then recognizing both scientific achievement and in particular mentoring. So I want to leave you with an image, because I'm still on yellow here. Uh, so I want to leave you with an image. So this is Archimedes. And Archimedes, uh, as you may remember, uh, discovered the principle of the lever. Uh, and as you know, the longer the lever, the more mechanical advantage, the less force it takes to move uh, an, uh, an object. And he came to the realization that, in fact, if you give me a place to stand, which maybe is a bit of a problem, uh, and a lever long enough that he can actually move the entire world, that the mechanical advantage be close to infinite, he could actually move the world. So this is the image that I would like to leave you with, that if you're a translational scientist and you have the lever of the scientific method and there's still some NIH support around, that in fact you can move the world and you can move it to improve health and also to achieve social justice. So with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate and again express my appreciation for the invitation.